As the Masters moved into the television era, the game was about to be transformed by three names. Nicholas, Player and Palmer. This plaque was unveiled in 1995 as a tribute to the man who perhaps more than anybody popularized the game of golf. And in the late 50s and early 60s, he dominated the Masters. With his glamorous attacking style and army of followers, Arnold Palmer's heroics thrilled the newly found television audience. He won his first Masters in 1958, finished third in 59, and was challenging again in 1960. Ken Venturi, now a CBS commentator, led by a stroke, leaving Palmer in the 17th needing two birdies to win. I was scared to death that I might not make it. It was a fairly sizable putt, and, and I just knew that I had to hit it hard enough to get to the hole. Well, I hit it pretty hard, and it hit the hole going pretty fast, but the good news is it went in. I was in the clubhouse, and now I figure, well, there's going to be a playoff. I would have loved to have had a playoff. And uh, I was really ready to go, and uh, I just thought that uh, this was my year. On the 18th, though, Palmer had other ideas. When the putt went in, I just looked at it and thinking that, you know, why did it have to happen like that? Ken is a good friend, and that was sad for him, but it was great for me. He was the first player to ever birdie 18 to win the Masters. But the next year, Player was in the clubhouse, and Palmer finishes 4-6. So right away I'm thinking, why me? I mean, what did I do to deserve this? Gary Player from Johannesburg was the first overseas golfer to really challenge for the Masters, but found himself very much the underdog facing the defending champion, Palmer. There are 100,000 people out here, and there's exactly 10 people pulling for me. When they talked about an Arnie's army, it was an army. And I didn't even have a gang. With Player finishing at eight under par, people were starting to take notice. Palmer, though, on the 18th tee, needed only a par to beat him. I made a fatal mistake, having driven it right in the middle of the fairway. I saw an old friend at the sidelines, and he was motioning for me to come over to say hello. And and I did that, and he shook hands, congratulating me on winning the tournament. Well, I knew better, but I was sort of a victim of circumstances then, and a weak mind also, and I accepted those congratulations. Here's the shot, it's a little bit off to the right, and look out, it's in the sand. The iron shot was very poor, and then rather than being sure to get it on the green and have a putt for a par, I went strongly for the uh, pin, and I caught it a little bit thin, and it went over the green. As Gary Player watched from the clubhouse, Palmer was unable to get close from off the green. He had to hold the resulting putt to tie. That's probably one of the most bitter uh, defeats that I've had in my life. Arnold and I had this great rivalry, which was healthy rivalry. We were great friends and had great admiration for each other. And that was very, very exciting uh, for Arnold to put on my first green jacket. The favor was returned the next year as Palmer won his third. A new name was about to enter the equation to complete the so-called Big Three. At 23, Jack Nicholas was 10 years younger than Arnold Palmer and not the crowd's favorite at first. But the big man with the big swing had a game that was ideal for Augusta National. It was a course that suited my game. It was a golf course that you had hit the ball relatively long on. Uh, you had enough room to do what you wanted to do. The par fives were, for a long hitter, fairly easy. And uh, uh, the only thing that I had trouble with and still have trouble with are the greens. The toughest, toughest set of greens in golf. It was the weather that proved toughest in 1963. And as it worsened, so did the scores. For Nicholas, Interpreting the scoreboard was yet another problem. It just poured down rain. Well, I just kept on playing. And we actually, we finished the round and we got to 18th hole. I, I'm colorblind, so I looked at the board and I looked over at my caddy and there was about half a dozen ones on the board. I, says, I said, Willie, I says, how many of those ones are red? He says, just you, boss. 
Nicholas maintained his lead to become the youngest winner so far. His first green jacket was presented by a man in search of a fourth. I had won three masters at that point in time, and I thought, why can't I just waltz through the field one time? I'd like to be able to walk up the 18th hole and not have to worry about whether I make a bogey or a birdie or a par. And the good news was that in 64, that happened. What was the reception like when you walked up 18? Well, it was fantastic. And, and of course, the people, they knew what was going through my mind. And on the other hand, a lot of people said, well, it wasn't as much fun as it was when you were making birdies on the last few holes to win. It was a record fourth victory for Palmer, but it was also to be his last. To this day, however, Arnie's army faithfully follow their hero around the course, which has meant so much to him. Everything that happens here is so traditional and is something that is a part of the game of golf that uh, I think will just go on forever. Nineteen sixty five was the year the Golden Bear took a huge bite out of the course. Jack Nicholas's score of two seven one beat Hogan's record by three strokes. His awe inspiring play prompting Bobby Jones to utter the famous phrase, He plays a game with which I am not familiar. Until this time, no one had successfully defended a Masters. Until Jack Nicholas that is. Earning his place in the Monday playoff, Nicholas became the first back to back winner when he emerged victorious in the fading light and put the green jacket on himself. It took Jack Nicholas another six years to win his next Masters in 1972. It wouldn't be his last. Some concern had been voiced about the way that Nicholas's record 1965 win had made the course look vulnerable. Would changes be required to protect it? True, the course had been evolving ever since the Masters was first played. At the 16th, for example, the green was moved across the creek and a lake was created. One of the most significant course alterations came in 1966 with the addition of two bunkers in the fairway of the par 4 18th. The decision ensured that the finishing hole would see even greater drama in future years. There is no other sport that I can think of where at the highest level competitors record their own scores. It is this reputation for honesty that golf is built upon, and there was no better illustration than in 1968 when the Masters witnessed one of the most extraordinary events in the history of the game. Roberto de Vicenzo of Argentina, on his 45th birthday, started the final day by holing his second shot the first, setting him up for a brilliant round of 65, which included a birdie three at the 17th after this fantastic approach. American Bob Golby was tied in the same leading score, 11 under par, but unbeknown to him, there was a problem with Di Vincenzo's scorecard. Playing partner Tommy Arn had recorded a four instead of a three for Di Vincenzo at the 17th, which he had incorrectly signed for. According to the rules of golf, the higher score had to count. I figured I needed a four to tie, and then when I left the green, I talked to Doc Middlecoff and he came over and put his arm around me. He said, Bob, you won this tournament. I said, what the hell are you talking about, Doc? He said, well, Roberto messed up his card. It's over with. And Bobby Jones said, you, know, you guys know the rules. Golby's the winner. I guess you'd say I was ecstatic. I assumed I had a playoff. Probably, as it turned out, I probably just as soon played off because it was unfortunate for Roberto, but it was equally unfortunate for me. I didn't really get credit for winning the tournament. Despite that, Golby, who shot a closing 66, always received a warm welcome at Augusta National. The saddest moments in Masters history occurred with the passing of Bobby Jones. Jones had always presided over the award ceremonies of what was, in essence, his tournament. But in latter years, suffering from a debilitating disease of the spine, he was confined to a wheelchair. Severely crippled, Illness finally took its toll in 1971. Clifford Roberts continued to run the club until his death six years later. And it is the legacy of Jones and Roberts that the tournament today is run to the very highest standards that they established.
A familiar duo returned to make the headlines. Gary Player won his second Masters in 1974, and the next year... 75 was probably, uh, probably the, the most fun Masters I've ever played in, win or lose, because uh, uh, both Weisskopf and Miller uh, played very, very well coming down the stretch, as did I. Nicholas stood in 11 under. Behind him, Johnny Miller in 10 under, and playing with Miller, Tom Weisskopf, taking the lead at the 15th with a birdie to go 12 under par. After a poor tee shot at the par 3 16th, Nicholas faced a huge putt for birdie. Now, up the hill. Oh, I think that's one of the greatest putts I've ever seen in my life. I hold that long putt at 16, which uh, almost uh, shut the door on the other two, because they just sort of all, they seem to just sort of, mm. Weisskopf appeared visibly shaken and could only bogey the 16th. But Johnny Miller recovered to make a fine birdie at the 17th. Now Miller and Weisskopf could tie Nicholas's score of 12 under if either could birdie the last. Miller furthest away putted first. Weisskopf was much closer. Oh, that looks good. Oh, it stayed out. Well, he must be disappointed in that. Weisskopf finished runner-up for the fourth time, leaving Jack Nicholas to claim a record fifth title. Nicholas was challenging again in 1977. This time, with three holes to play, he was tied for the lead with Tom Watson. 16, I made a par but I hit a shot that I was most proud of, which was a three-quarter five-iron shot. It was about 12, 15 feet past the pin. It was a great shot, and it kind of re just released all the pressure it had built up. And so I played the last two holes without a lot of pressure on me. The 17th, what a crucial putt for Watson. This for the lead. It is. It's turning. It's there. It's there. What a moment for this young fella. And it was the defining moment as Watson went on to win the first of two Masters titles. 77 was really the, the year that jump started my career. Playing against the best player who ever played the game and winning, uh, that was a sense of accomplishment. In 1978, Gary Player found himself seven shots behind the leader, Hubert Green, coming into the final round. It was his cue for a quite amazing performance. I shoot 30 on the backside, the lowest score ever. But the amazing thing is that in that 30, I actually rimmed the hole with putts three times. And I often say thank you that those putts never went in. Because if you shot 27, you'd never get invited back here. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievably, Gary had fought his way back into a four-way tie for the lead. On the last hole, I stood there. And my caddy, Eddie, said, please, win this tournament, I need a new house. And I said, I'm going to try my best for you. And I looked at that scoreboard and I said, I've got to hold this. And it went right in the middle. And Ballesteros came across the green and gave me this great brotherly hug, which was fantastic. It wasn't over yet. After a great approach to the last, Hubert Green had a three-footer to tie. But when he overheard the radio commentator just off the green, his concentration was fatally disturbed. At the age of 42, Gary Player became the oldest champion to wear the famous green jacket. It was also his last, but 20 years later he was breaking another record, eclipsing Sam Snead as the oldest player to make the cut at the Masters. This has been a very, very happy hunting ground for me, not only having won it three times, but being second on three occasions, and now being the oldest man to make the cut. It was a very, very special thing for me. The playoff format at the Masters was changed to sudden death, starting at the 10th hole in 1978. It wasn't required then and shouldn't have been the next year. Masters first timer Fuzzy Zeller and Tom Watson watched from the scorer's tent as Ed Sneed needed to hole a pot in the last to beat them by a stroke. Sneed, who'd bogeyed the last three holes, now found himself tied with Watson and Zeller. 
I'm excited as hell. You know, I, I've already accomplished my goal, and my mission was to get back in for the next year. So now I get to go on the very first playoff ever, my very first time there. So I've got nothing to lose. I'm relaxed as hell. I'm going out there to try to beat the other two guys. After all three had parred the 10th, Zeller played a superb eight iron second to the 11th. With Watson and Sneed failing to make birdies, Zeller had a putt to win. It's funny, uh, before I got to hit my putt from eight foot range, you think about all the times that you've had that putt while you were practicing as a junior golfer. I'm one of the fortunate few. I had my putt for the Masters, and I made it. But what a great feeling. The roar from the galleries was just unbelievable. It was a dream. It was a dream come true.